they tell you that you're out of time, that you have to start switching. So uh, try to like, you know, I'll also, I'm also sort of going to do like this, and then be watching the time, and then I'll start moving closer and closer, and then holding the phone up higher and higher, which means you're out of time. <laughs> That's your cue. Um, all right. So uh, one other thing I'll mention is um, I have. So we have. Yes, right. I'm running out of time. Um, so we have uh, six, or we have five speakers. I have one remote video that I'm going to play for somebody if we, if we don't. And I've got three people on backup, including myself, who were going to speak yesterday. But if you're interested in doing a lightning talk, right, I want to have as much variety as possible, and I don't want to talk. So if you want to go, the 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 form is still open to add two more to add two more slots. I want to encourage people because we haven't had very many. Lighting talks from the UFO community yet, or the IAM community. So, you know, for those folks in those communities, I want to get we want more variety here. So, that's my quick pitch. And you still have plenty of time right now to sign up. So, anyway, about 30 minutes before we get to that. Um, first speaker, Nico from the OE project. Uh, I forget. All oh, right, <laughs> talking about Bootstrap and Font Awesome. Where is it? Oh, okay, sorry. Go Good slides. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about a uh, change that we made in the last year, which I actually think is, is really awesome being a uh, sort of UI guy. So as you sort of develop a project and start to add things to that project, you really start to uh, accumulate CSS. And it's, it's actually really hard to keep that high-level overview uh, and make sure that the CSS is sort of modular, reusable, consistent. And so over time, you start to grapple with uh, like cross browser issues, inconsistencies. Um, sometimes you create things that are hard to scan and so on. And this is something that happened for us as well. Uh, so, so back in January, we decided to use a, uh, a CSS framework, and the obvious choice was Twitter Bootstrap. That's what most people seem to be using these days. Um, and at this point, everything in UI is actually based on Bootstrap. It is a first party group, and everything is based on it. Um, we were a bit hesitant to start off with, so that thinking that Bootstrap seems pretty generic. Uh, will we be overriding it all the time, and will we just end up with more CSS than we have right now? Uh, but we decided to do it anyway. Um, and the this is Bootstrap. Um, and the change has been absolutely awesome. It's been amazing. Uh, we've been able to decimate the amount of custom CSS that we have. Um, there's many widgets in our UI now that actually don't have any custom CSS at all. Uh, and if there is any, it's mostly just margins and headings. Um, has tremendously helped increase consistency. Um, all the documentation is already there, so we actually don't have to document things anymore. Uh, users, uh, developers might be a bit might be familiar with this already, so that helps as well. Um, it, had re it has reduced the number of cross-browser issues that we have pretty significantly. So I'll just show a little bit about the sort of things that they offer. Um, so this is all pretty well documented on their website. They've got their sort of whole grid system that allows you to do all sorts of, uh, of layouts. And again, we can just, uh, in OE, use whatever code they document on their site, and it will actually work. Um, so this is their base stuff, and they've got a whole bunch of stuff for things like buttons and forms and uh, tables and whatever. Um, so the different types of buttons, for example. And so this is what we are using in our, uh, in our UI as well. And again, we can just reuse whatever they have documented. Um, and then we've got a whole bunch of um, slightly more advanced components, uh, like things like drop downs, modal dialogues, um, things like notification messages, progress bars. It's actually been amazing how much of our UI this covers. Um, and in many of these cases, we'll just be able to go with the default uh, behavior. The margins and the patterns will be taken care of. It'll be really easy to, uh, to sort of reuse. Um, one thing that um, Bootstrap does is defines colors as well, which is actually not that good for an application that we want to be able to use um, at various institutions that we all want to do their own branding and skinning. Uh, so one thing that we did is we pulled out all of the um, the colors that Bootstrap defined and pulled them into the less file, um, and which basically allows us to create this UI where, um, in the administration UI, you can actually override those values. Um, and so the last file is the only file in the entire UI where we define any colors. There's no colors anywhere in the code base. Uh, so everything can be skimmed. <coughs> um, one of the things that <coughs> offer as well are these icons. 
um, a whole bunch of icons based on glyph icons. Um, and the way in which you use them is by doing this i class with a certain, uh, or this i tag with a certain class documented over here. Um, now, that's pretty cool, almost awesome. Um, but they are still background images, which have a few, um, which obviously have a few issues. Which is why we started to use something that's called Font Awesome. This is an extension to Bootstrap and is basically a icon font. Yes, um, where the characters of the font are mapped to uh, like vector images which represent the icon. Um, what this means is they've got a list of they've got a ton of icons they support. Um, it extends Bootstrap, so you can use the same classes as documented on the Bootstrap uh, website. Um, but these are all vectors. Uh, it means that there's no images um, for any of the icons that you use. Um, because there's like, this is actually a font, you can style it with CSS, so you can change its size, you can change its color, it will actually sort of take over the, the, the size and the color of the context that it's in, or you can style it separately, um, which makes it a lot more maintainable. It means that you don't have to have custom images for a skin that you have. It means that you can add stuff and just be able to style it. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll actually quickly show how easy it is to use. Um, so maybe let's take this magic, icon magic, um, and I'll go to OAE. This is an, uh, an OAE page. You'll see that like, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, all of these are all um, font awesome icons. So I'll actually go ahead and I'll do some editing on the fly. Yep, you're good. Right. So create the list item. OK, so I've got the list item, and then I can just put in i class equals z. What's wrong here? I there you go. And it just shows up over there, um, which is actually really cool. It takes on the style and color. Uh, or if I wanted to style it separately, I could just do uh, color green, become green, or font size pixels. <laughs> on minus. And you'll make it bigger. And it works really well on that, like high resolution displays rather than on the small so That's what we're using. It's really cool. <laughs> Very good. Uh, any questions? No? no time for wasting time on the applause till the end. Uh, <laughs> any questions for Nico? Go. Go for one of your own um, TSS files. Uh, I kind of need to make a request to include TSS files. So we actually have a, uh, a backend service. We have a oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Start swapping while you're answering. <laughs> so, so we can, uh, like, we can push the the color that we want configured into that service, and then that service will actually, uh, at the endpoint, once a new once a new value is pushed in, it will regenerate and regenerate the old file, fix up the last file, uh, and then we've got an endpoint that serves that. Can you create your own font sets uh, with your own icons to use in the center? Um, you can create a, so there's an open source tool on GitHub that you can use to create uh, fonts like this. So if you want to do custom icons, currently you have to do a, a, a second font and include that as well. Um, that's what we do right now. One more question, if there are any. Looks like you're still setting up your screen. So. <laughs> no more questions? OK. Stuart uh, is going to also the, oh, well, I guess, first tech and currently the OAE project also, or half and half, I guess, um, is going to uh, tell us about Travis something, whatever that is. I don't actually know. Or find out. Travis CI. Travis CI. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm Stuart Freeman of Georgia Tech uh, for Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, so the first question, yes, is who is Travis? Uh, it's a hosted continuous integration <laughs> service uh, for the open source community. Uh, and that, that's actually a line copied right off of their website. Um, so if you don't 
that kind of goes over your head. Uh, if you use Hudson or Jenkins, uh, a similar thing, but it's, it's cloud hosted. So um, when you uh, actually put your, your code up on GitHub, which is what you say in with GitHub, uh, it actually spawns a new virtual machine, runs all of your uh, integration tests, or your unit testing and integration tests, and then um, rolls that machine back to its snapshot after you know, saving out a report. Uh, it has support uh, for all of these languages. I've highlighted Java and JavaScript node because they are uh, very popular in the area of communities. Uh, but if you happen to like to write in any of these other ones, they're also supported. Um, but really, because it's just a VM running Linux, if you can automate it on Linux, then you can run it on Travis. So how do you use it? Uh, you log in to uh, the Travis website, GitHub's OAuth. Uh, you enable a service hook. I'm, I'm, I'll demo this one. Uh, then you add a .travis. Uh, YAML file to your source tree to, to tell Travis uh, what it needs to do when it sees this code come in. Uh, and then you just start pushing changes to your GitHub repo. And with every uh, push or pull request that goes in, uh, Travis will run a build and uh, have a report. That's all we need to mention. So this is um, the, the Sakai project Hillary is with our back end for OAE. Uh, you can see that our builds are currently failing as of two minutes and 20 seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> but prior to that, we had four good builds in a row. So. We did that two minutes. Simon. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, if we go to the, the current tab and the um, so if doesn't die on me, you can see that, yeah, that was Simon. Um, and we get the, the full log of what went out to the, the terminal uh, when the tests were run. Uh, these ones that have sort of a gray background with the before install on the side uh, are actually the commands that, it's, that are being run, and the before install is the, the stage of Travis build that they came from. Uh, so you can see it's, it's just doing um, standard Unix command stuff, starting and stopping services that we need or don't need, uh, cloning stuff that we get uh, in order to, to actually run the tests. So, uh, where I said you turn on a, uh, a service hook, that's what this screen is. Because I'm, I've logged in using GitHub Go Off, uh, Travis actually has access to, to the list of Get repositories that I have administrative access to. Um, all the ones that start with steward F are in my actual account. That's why I have administrative access. And I can just click on this um, little button here to enable the service hook for one of those repos, uh, which will just mean that over on the GitHub side of things, when a push or a pull request comes in, uh, it will contact Travis and, and Run the my tests. Uh, so on an actual repository in GitHub, uh, you can see we actually have uh, a little build passing icon at this because I loaded it before signing in for the test. So if I refresh, we'll see that it actually changes to. Signs is a pull request. Oh, that's a pull request. Oh. Okay, as a pull request was the one that was broken. So yeah, our actually so that build that had failed in the other screen was a, a pull request that hasn't actually been merged to our master. So actually, the thing that um, if you were to go to GitHub and grab our code right now, you can get a working version. So this this is exactly why you use Travis. So that <laughs> no one goes and merges Simon and stuff in general. <laughs> it's all part of this presentation. <laughs> So, <laughs> so this is the, the Travis YAML file. Uh, I'm not going to go through it line by line, uh, but you can see you specify your language and uh, the version of it, <laughs> and then all the, the sort of commands that it needs to run. 
um, and it has different stages for um, actually the one there it says script growing test state for thing actually does our um, build tests. All the rest of that is just uh, setting up uh, to run the test and then sort of what to do if it fails and at the bottom you can see it actually sends email to the, the OAE team uh, in the event of a failure. Actually, this is in the event of a change. So it goes from passing to failing to failing to passing. And what's this? <laughs> I have an for a reason. Oh, this is this was the um, readme.md file. Um, this is what you put in um, the top level of your uh, GitHub repository source. Uh, and this line that says build status and then abstract CI, the Marine PNG branch master. So that's what put the little icon in um, the readme on the front page of the thing. And this is what a pull request looks like. Uh, so this is this is code that actually has not been merged or mastery yet, uh, but because uh, Bert has asked, or actually Bert asked me to do some more, I did the work, and then I asked uh, the team to, to uh, review this code and merge it into master. And you can see Travis has actually run on it already and said it passes all the tests. So um, it's not necessarily good to merge yet. <laughs> uh, really but you have some some uh, automated review already done. Some companies. and we can probably find Simon's request and want to see where it's going to fail. But it, I mean, it's kind of obvious where we're looking at this, right? Pretty soon, I'm going to be standing on you. <laughs> oh, am I like yes, right at time? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're slightly yeah. over, but <laughs> that's all right. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just going by really quick. I didn't sort of seven or eight hearing kind of buzzer. Can you put a fog horn? That's the overtime one. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Any questions? <laughs> While people are answer, asking questions, the next person needs to start heading up. If there are any questions, which is definitely mine. Does that tie into the other cloud platforms? Mike, like Roku. Um, well, from Heroku, what you would do is you would just clone your master after it's in and push back to it. Because it, Heroku is just a um, GitHub repository for deployment. You just push. Any other questions? On my experience set up. Um, I forgot what you're talking about. Oh, Jack's B. Where are you? Where, who are you associated with? Oh. Uh, University of Wisconsin. Oh, UW Madison. Okay, great. Good. So we are getting we are getting new portal people. That is fantastic. So Mike from UW Madison. And talk about Jack's B and something to that effect. <laughs> whenever, whenever he gets his screen bigger. <laughs> and how do you do that? <laughs> uh, you do that. Oh, maybe. <laughs> oh, uh, clone your display. Set your display to um, there. Preferences. Displays. legacy course resources. The application was presents a list of courses for students. So the title of the talk was a really long one about that, but I was told that was boring, so it's just why Jaxby, which is Java architecture for XML bindings. So as you can see from this little picture here, everybody see the mouse? So it goes both ways. You can um, take Java and generate XML, or you can take XML and generate Java what we're doing, because they're using um, XSTs to 
model the data for what is used in the course department. So I had to get familiar with uh, this tool and with XSDs. So it takes them um, through the compiler and then generates the JAX D annotated classes, which are real ugly Java classes, and an uh, object factory to generate the instances. So now for the real trick is to remote back to Madison. So XSDs look like this, for those who don't know. Uh, basically like XML, but it's defining data types and the organization of them. And then there is a findings file that allows you to associate your XSD here with a package name. So when your job is generated, it uh, puts in a standard kind of big long package name format. There's some other tricks you can do. I'm just going to deal with the basics. Question? Okay. Um, let's see. So we're using the Maven build tool. So there is a Jaxi plugin that allows you to specify a great deal of parameters. There's a whole lot of parameters for if you're running the tool, it's XJC is the command line tool to generate the Java code from the XML. And this is where we're going to have to get this. Right, you have it probably off screen. Yeah. So, yeah. I can grab that. Yeah. Grab that right there. You grabbed it a little too high. No. Oh. Uh, well, I want what's on the right, right side. Yeah, yeah, right. It's not much of a problem. I don't want that. I want that's all right. What's the key that lets you explode the windows? You know what I mean? Unless you like that. That's what it's all right. That one. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you just hit. Yeah. I don't see the key. Those are fine. That's all right. Um, so, I had to make changes. I was um, expanding the data model, it was kind of a simple data model. And I added a bunch of stuff. So they already had some, uh, as we saw, these XSDs. And there was a common one. So I had to put, uh, added some stuff, moved some stuff around, and found out that I fat fingered XSD quite a bit. And so I got tired of reading the uh, SACS parser errors when I tried to generate the sources. And so I discovered there are online validation tools for XSD, which in some cases, help give a better error message to let me know where I screwed up when I cut and pasted or fast fingered it. Um, so that's some of the lessons learned. The um uh, you know the online tool you use was? Yeah, it's like XSD validator. Yeah, I just thought you had to use Google for XSD validator. Sorry. Anyhow, this is the or not. Yeah, I intentionally caused the compiler error, so you know we can't see what the ugly Java codes look like. That's all right. F five. F five. Or we'll have to hold a function hugger function and F five. It's kind of just. No, it'll be, uh, it'll be under source or edit maybe. Uh, yeah, the way Eclipse is configured, you have to do run as. She isn't oh, big. Like, right, I was just trying to get the yeah, just mark. Oh, that's all right. Um, so yeah, some of the lessons learned about having to track down the errors. Uh, what's the pros and cons for this? You can either be an XSD programmer or a Java programmer. So actually, the XSD is kind of a simpler format than having to learn all the annotation rules to uglify the Java code. That's it. All right, good. Only slightly, way better. Um, <laughs> any questions? Questions about Jaxby, questions about UW Madison? <laughs> no? All right, next.
I'm Margaret Brown from Pepperdine. I'm going to make this real quick because I'm not going to show you anything. I'm just going to ask for something. I figured if I got a room full of developers, uh, you know, the, it, it's it's a chance to just ask for the favorite thing that I've been looking for. So I teach online, is, and um, in, in the forums, knowledge building is really an important part of what I do. And what I would really like is some way to um, mark messages as I'm reading them as wonderfully insightful. What I want is a button, the drop down button that allows me a few choices so that I can grade that message quickly and efficiently, or a like button so that students can indicate the messages that they said were most important. So, you know, a like button or a quick way to register that this student has, you know, reached some extra level of, of writing that isn't going to be easily visible when I go back and look at the list of, you know, the length of messages and the number of messages they sent. So it's a quality measure. That's all. Well, it's easy. Does anybody have any thoughts and comments? Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we can get uh, you know, a little bit. basically a sort of a modular component with HTML, CSS, some JavaScript, some uh, interstitialization bundles in there. Um, and they have a configuration file that sort of glues everything together and, and makes it all work nice. Um, the reason we use it is, well, there's a short answer is because it's easy. And the long answer is, is too long for this, so I'm going to try to like, shorten it into so like a mashup. So basically, because um, widgets are, are small, they are sort of a specific set of functionality. <coughs> Uh, which makes them manageable, so it's all it's all under the sort of easy factor, and um, they are reusable as well. Which means that you can sort of embed video or images uh, with the same widget on different pages. And it makes it easy. So there are two ways of, of using a widget. Um, they all sort of do the same thing, but you can sort of categorize them into widgets that build a page, like left hand nav, the top nav, uh, footer all that kind of stuff. And then there's um, there's widgets that support the context of the page, like um, like editing permissions, um, adding members, and importing videos. So including the widgets on a page is very easy. Just add a div statement, um, add a data widget in there, which in this case is footer. That'll load in the, the footer when the page is loaded. Or um, you can laser load the widget, which um, is, a, is a big performance um, aim in our case. So they aren't actually loaded when you um, load up the page, but when you, for example, click a button that has a certain selector defined on it, um, it will load the widget and open uh, it up. Another way to do it is to send out an event that is, again, configured in the widget. So that's all pretty straightforward. Um, you can find a few resources out there to, to help you actually develop, develop a widget. Uh, one, of, one of the most up-to-date ones is the docs endpoint that we have on um, on each tenant that you spin up, it's, it's always up to date because you have the docs generated from the JS doc that is actually in your code. So since we are actually writing the JS doc, this should be up to date at every point in time, so that's pretty good. Um, so you can find that there. There's also a bunch of reusable components. Nico talked about Bootstrap, so we're using that. Um, it's awesome because we have all this, and you can just reuse it. Lists, buttons, icons, um, fault awesome icons. Look again. There you go. Uh, we have some support on the IRC channel as well. We have a list. Uh, you can uh, you can ask your questions on there. So the last thing I want to I want to tell you about is is that um, widgets are part of our contribution model for um, you know people just go in and contribute widgets back to us. It's pretty easy. And um, we have a widget library where people can go in and upload their widgets. 
so we can review them and add them to the library. And then everyone that wants to can download the widget, put it in their, um, in their installation, and use it. Now, the widget SDK that we, that we have as well is not, not up to date, so you, you'd be better off looking at the docs endpoint that I just discussed. Um, but <laughs> what you'll be able to find there is, um, so right now, documentation is worthless, it needs to be updated with the docs endpoint. But you'll find a widget uh, skeleton framework, which you can download um, instead of starting from scratch. I uh, found some examples <coughs> at some point documentation. That's it. Widgets. <laughs> oh, you're like way ahead of time if you want to demo it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, I've got it right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Also, uh, you know, don't feel too bad about having documentation out of day or anything. So this is the, um, the library on the story that we have. It's currently empty, but what you see here is in the center we have the library widget, which sort of supports the context of this, this page, as I mentioned before. And you can upload stuff in here. Like this. So, um, it will lazy load the upload widget. So, so the content profile. This will load the content uh, context basically, and this is uh, sort of a preview of a random guy that I don't know. It's in my library for some reason. Um, this is a widget on its own. Uh, you have the top navigation here, which is a widget. You have the footer. Which is small, but is a widget. A couple of comments right here. You can add some Google comments here. You know, all, of these, all of these things are widgets. Uh, I'm not Get about it. <laughs> Let's show you some other widgets. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have some uh, Elasticsearch powered stuff in here, which is uh, searching through. Um, all the stuff that I have in there. So if you see this guy, uh, this guy is being rendered in the search widget. Uh, you can switch views here and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I should I should show you the difference between the lazy loading context that I described and well, the widgets that are actually put on the page <coughs> um, and loaded while the, when the page is loaded. So the top navigation footer and the left hand navigation right here are widgets that are included in our, um, our main, um, main file that we have. We have about six or seven. Those are added as a, as a div with the data widget that's attributed on there. Um, the, other, the other things that are hidden away here, like my picture, upload, creating links, documents, all that kind of stuff, those aren't actually loaded when you load the page. But when you click them, um, they will be lazy loaded onto the page. So this, um, this is something that we introduced last year. As <laughs> I was going to say that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, the alarm disagrees or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid alarm. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Does anyone have any questions for Bert? Everything was so well presented, there are no questions. That's always good. All right, so I'll Okay, so uh, who is not using Scrum? So everybody's using Scrum? Yeah, there you go. Uh, so I'll, I'll just, well, uh, this will be pretty quick. But uh, everybody else is using uh, Agile Scrum at back no, at your institution? No, we're not using Scrum. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, there you go. I'll see what I'm too embarrassed to say, but we'll see what we're not using Yeah. Well, I thought that was going to be a bad one. How many people are using Scrum? All right. Well, you know, because I figured not everybody raises their hand. And, uh, all right. We'll, uh, it's all right. It's okay. Uh, I think we want to. Um, Let me see if this magically uh, picks it up. It does. Um, all right. So this is. Uh, I put the uh, the title was how uh, Scrum saved my uh, work life. But uh, so this will be really quick because a lot of you are familiar. But um, it just was a really enlightening to me um, 
five months ago, this is how I was managing uh, our portal group. I had, and I thought it was pretty advanced because I was using a wiki page, which made it easy for me to uh, keep my uh, task list, uh, you know, make a new copy of it every week, and then we go into my meetings uh, with this task list, and I didn't have to type all this stuff in. But that's all it was, and things just kept building up, and I keep shoving stuff to the uh, back. And uh, so this is um, this is actually a copy of uh, Eric Dahlquist's uh, printout of it, where we'd go in a meeting and he'd make some notes about what he had to do. Kind of gave him some direction on where he was going to go for the uh, for the week. But of course, uh, then we'd come in with some urgent requests, and he'd actually write things down on post-it notes and put it on his uh, map for the week. And then we get a few more uh, things would come in, and things would just be changing over the course of the week. Um, and this is how we were managing um, how work was done on the team. Um, and he'd have to put reminders of, oh, he's got to talk with uh, another person. There's another person that um, uh, a product manager for us that I work with quite closely with. And uh, she'd be coming in with demands, or she'd want status on stuff. And he'd have to make notes to uh, send status updates. So this is really quite a mess. But um, Four months ago, we added two new developers to the team, and we decided we we're going to really jump in full force uh, and do Agile Scrum. And uh, so now, uh, when new work comes in, if I have some a new request or uh, Annette has an urgent request coming in, we just go into Jira and we, we use um, Jira with the Grasshopper uh, or Greenhopper uh, plugin uh, to manage our Agile process. We just go in and we add that, um, add a little uh, description of what we need done. Or if Eric figures out that he needs to do something, he'll add um, something, uh, add data tables to resource server. And he'll just create it. It really literally takes um, 30 seconds to uh, it create some new work. And then um, uh, once a week, Annette and I are getting together as kind of the face of the customers. And uh, we have a meeting for maybe half an hour, uh, maybe an hour, where we look at all of the stuff that's in the uh, backlog, all the work that's been created that's not being worked on now, and we prioritize. And we're just able to you know, quickly go in here, have a meeting together, and come to an agreement uh, on whose work is more important, my work or, who work, or her work. And uh, we just kind of figure that out um, and easily put this in the order of what um, Whatever is most important is going to be at the top. Um, then there's the uh, grooming phase, and this is where um, Eric and the other developers uh, get together, and they look at this list, and they go down the list. Anything that doesn't have um, a little uh, estimation of how much time it's going to take, uh, you can see the, um, like the fifth one down doesn't have anything. They'll go in there, and they'll look at it. They'll have a quick conversation. You know, how big a deal do we think this is? And they'll put an estimate in there. Uh, the story uh, points that we're using for estimating is one point is approximately one work day. And if there's something that's really big, they'll immediately, you know, have a conversation and kind of break it into multiple um, story points. And uh, the nice thing is um, they can just go over to the student union hang out on the, uh, on the terrace, uh, maybe have a drink, and do this with their, uh, everybody looking at a laptop. So uh, you don't have to be, uh, you can do it anywhere. Um, makes uh, that kind of planning a little bit uh, um, uh, more enjoyable. So then uh, we'll get into a sprint planning meeting where we'll all get together. Um, I'll, I'll get together with Annette and uh, with the developers, and we'll just decide uh, how much we think we can get in, but that's actually planning meeting is pretty darn easy because we've already prioritized the work. We know how many uh, story points we can get done in a two-week sprint. We just drag this slider down in um, Greenhopper and, and we create it. Uh, we go through it and do our review. Uh, we've got a nice monitor set up so we can actually do this uh, all together at a table. And our um, yeah, planning meetings are quick. It's easy to see how you're doing tracking the work when you're in uh, Greenhopper. It's really easy for the developers to, uh, to process that. And uh, we'll have a review meeting at the end of the two-week sprint and see how well we've done. Um, our, actually, our estimations are running pretty close. Um, 
to uh, we're doing a little bit more. We're completing a little bit more work than we actually think we uh, um, we're going to complete. Um, and uh, that's it. I'll just leave it at that. It's really so. If we took the jump, um, and it's been a great four months. We are really pleased. I also want to make a point that just because everybody here, for example, uses Eclipse, doesn't mean that someone can't do a presentation about something in Eclipse, right? Just because we all do Agile Scrum doesn't mean that anybody that we didn't learn anything new from a presentation about Scrum. So. And I guess the main message: if you aren't doing it. Um, take the jump. I was resistant to jumping in full force, but we did, um, and it's been the best thing ever for the team. So, uh, you used Grasshopper, but was it by uh, Greenhopper? Greenhopper. Go ahead. <laughs> was it was it a particular choice, or was it would you recommend it, or were there other tools to look at? I would totally uh, recommend it. We didn't look at any other tools. We've been running uh, Jira just to um, uh, manage uh, issues and such, and um, we. Uh, Purchased the Green Hopper plugin uh, because some other group was interested in it. Um, but we've, uh, it seems to be really easy. They do a good job. Uh, there's a number of ways that they can, um, you don't have to just do Scrum. There's another other ways that Green Hopper can um, play well for your project management. And now we've got, we've, we've given this talk um, and an hour long brown bag um, to other groups and now a bunch of groups in the division are interested in using this. Cool. Cool. Thanks. All right. So I'm shooting you, by the way, I was. He's <laughs> using <laughs> magic on the screen. <laughs> I would shoot you. <laughs> um, all right. So last last presentation for the day, um, which will run us a little bit over, but you know, I have nowhere to go until six, right? Um, Brandon's going to talk about M Collective. Yes. Yes. All right. Go. So it's a little while ago when our clusters started getting huge, we started running M Collective. Um, M Collective uh, allows us to do parallel execution of commands across a large number of machines, which is very helpful. Um, we have a little over 20, 20 machines running in our cluster. And for example, if I need to figure out if what version of a package is installed on all the machines, or if I had to, have to reboot a service, or install a new service, so I don't want to have to SSH into each one of them and do it manually. Uh, so this is how it works, because I had no idea how it worked at first, and it intimidated me and frightened me. Um, but now I understand how it works, and so I'll share that with you. Um, you, uh, you log into a client machine or a controller. When you do some kind of M collective command, it goes to an active MQ uh, messaging system that all your nodes in your cluster are subscribed to. They receive a message. Uh, they send a, res a response message back to active which your client machine also subscribes to, and then it, it receives them all. So it just kind of waits for everybody to for everybody to reply, and if nobody replies within some bigger block amount of time, then it says the machine is, is sleeping well. So now I'm just going to do a little demo. Quick. So this is one of our machines. Uh, so if I do uh, like an MCO ping, for example, so this is our this is the client machine. It's the one that um, that issues the request to all the machines. So here I just did a little ping, which basically sees whether or not um, Collective is running on the machines, and then they come back. So here's our our large cluster of machines, application servers, activity servers. They all have certain roles. Um, if I wanted to see the the status of our Node.js package, what what version is Node of Node.js is running on the machines? Maybe they're out of date. I can do MCO package status. Node.js, and then it'll send that message out. A lot of them will say, we don't have it installed. But then a lot of them will say, we do have them installed. And then we're all, they're all running the same version. So I can run a command like, I'm not going to do it, because this is actually <coughs> running our OE project.org. But I could do MCO package upgrade Node.js, and then it will cause them all to upgrade that package. Or package install Node.js something, and those who don't have it will get it. Um, for services, I can do MCO service status. Uh, let's say Cassandra. Cassandra. So see if they're all up and running. Um, so with DD0, 1, and 2, I'll have Cassandra running. The rest of them don't. Um, I can check the Java version or whatever, but you get the idea. Um, so uh, services, packages, and 
um, some little things like MCO ping you can do. Um, it does have things for Puppet. If you're running Puppet, you can just do uh, apply your Puppet manifest across all the machines in your cluster at once. Um, you can do things like check the Puppet uh, status, I think. Yep, that'll work. So it'll say the last time it ran on all the machines, we called it Puppet. Um, you can see the summary if there were errors when Puppet ran. So maybe so you're getting some kind of configuration drift now because there's some errors in the Puppet manifest. Um, so it'll kind of give you statistics uh, about that. So it's a good bird's eye view of everything that's going on in your cluster and how things are running. Questions? Can you uh, filter so that you run a command on oh, the yeah. of machine? Thank you. Uh, so you can filter on Puppet Manifest uh, which machines have certain things installed. I don't know the syntax of that actually. Um, but for something like just tell me about this machine, I can do Puppet Summary I of DB0. So dash I is to filter, and then it'll just do summary statistics for one node. It's like you just restart Cassandra on that node, for example. So you can have those filtering things. Uh, John, do you have a question? How does this compare to like Capistrano? Uh, yeah. From what I understand, Capistrano um, will do like SSH. It, it'll, it works differently. I'm not exactly sure. Um, same space, though. The reason, the reason, yeah, same space. The reason we chose mCollected is because it had built-in Puppet functionality, and I don't think Capistrano does. Uh, that's the only reason we could be picked it over. Yeah. Any other questions? Going, going. All right. Um, please thank all the speakers. Really quick survey. So, um, so we'd like to keep doing lightning talks in future conferences. But I'm curious, how many thought that the lightning talks should have been uh, longer? So longer than five minutes, essentially, maybe seven minutes. A few people. Okay. How many think the lightning talks should be shorter than five minutes? Which is probably not manageable. Okay, good. <laughs> so we might try to do seven minute lightning talks. Um, how many think that they would like to have seen more lightning talks in the next conference? Like. Okay, that's a couple. Um, <laughs> anybody think we, sh we should have less sliding talks in that? Okay, that's good. That's good feedback. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you again, the speakers, and have fun at the demo session.